Hi, students, and welcome to chapter three. Um, we skipped this one in module one, so we kind of skipped over chapter three, and we're coming back to it now um, to kind of include it in the second module or the second unit. Chapter three will talk a lot about molecules and cells and introduction to organic compounds. Um, and we're first going to have a little introduction. Most adults cannot properly digest dairy products. These people are lactose intolerant because they lack the enzyme lactase. And this just illustrates the importance of biological molecules such as lactase in the daily functions of living organisms. So we're going to talk a little bit about these biological molecules. So this is kind of what we'll cover in this chapter. It's a little lengthy. Um, so I would encourage you guys to download the PowerPoints and watch the animations that are, that are included in the PowerPoints. Um, and also use the, um, the My Lab and Mastery materials to quiz yourself after you kind of studied on your own. There's a lot of great um, just quiz questions and test questions that the online resources offer as well. Um, so here we go with an introduction to organic compounds. Um, life's molecular diversity is based on the properties of carbon, and that's because carbon has the ability to bond with four other atoms and it'll be the basis for building large and diverse different organic compounds. Carbon chains will form the backbone of most organic molecules. An isomer has the same molecular formula, but different structures. And hydrocarbons are composed of only carbon and hydrogen. So the checkpoint question we have, methamphetamine occurs as two isomers. One is the addictive illegal drug known as crank or meth, and the other is a sinus medication. How can you explain these different, differing effects? And that's because they are isomers, so they have the same molecular formula, meaning they have the same number of atoms, but just their atoms are arranged differently. So this is a look how um, methane is arranged. So there's a carbon atom in the middle with four hydrogen atoms around it, and it has kind of this uh, pyramidal type shape. Here's just a look at how the carbon skeletons may be arranged in rings or vary in length, or there could be a double bond if there uh, is a double line between the carbon atoms. Um, so these are kind of four ways in which carbon skeletons could vary. Your ethane and profane are just two um, names for different hydrocarbons made up of carbon and hydrogens. Here's what a double bond looks like when we um, draw, um, draw it on paper. We put two straight lines instead of one, so that signifies a double bond. And this is just showing you uh, different ways that we write molecular formulas of organic compounds, showing how the carbons are added to the hydrogens. Here's a look at butane and isobutane. Here are cyclic carbon hydrocarbons, so where the carbons um, kind of make up a ring, whether that's a hexagon um, shape with double bonds or single bonds around it and the hydrogens coming off of it. So these are all molecules and how they're arranged in space and how their atoms are arranged. These are great animations that take you through isomers, carbon skeletons, and more isomers. And I would encourage you guys to download the PowerPoint on your own and read and watch those. A few chemical groups are key to the functioning of biological molecules. An organic compound's properties depend on the size and shape of its carbon back, backbone and the atoms attached to that skeleton. Hydrophilic functional groups give organic molecules specific chemical properties. And the next table we'll look at will illustrate six important chemical groups. And these are different chemical groups. Um, you can have an OH called a hydroxyl group, our carbonyl group, carboxyl group, an amino group, a phosphate group, and a methyl group. So these are just different types of organic compounds based on the chemical group. So a few chemical groups are key to the functioning of biological molecules, part two. Uh, the, for example, the sex hormones testosterone and estradiol, which is a type of estrogen, differ only in the groups of atoms um, that are highlighted in figure 3.2. All right, here's a look at testosterone, testosterone and estradiol. So you can just see how the different atoms that are highlighted are differing just very, very slightly 
um, to give these hormones very different properties. Well, there's the differences in the chemical groups of the sex hormones. The four classes of biological molecules contain very large molecules, and they're often called macromolecules because of their large size. They're also called polymers because they're made from identical or similar building blocks strung together. And the building blocks of polymers are singularly called a monomer. Monomers are linked together to form a polymer through a dehydration reaction and polymers are broken down by hydrolysis. These reactions are mediated or helped along by enzymes, which will speed up reactions. A checkpoint question, suppose you eat some cheese, what reactions must occur for the protein of the cheese to be broken down it's to an, into its amino acid monomers, and then for these monomers be, to be converted into your body? So first of all, for the um, cheese to be broken down, um, with those are broken down by hydrolysis and the amino acid monomers that are coming from the protein in that cheese will then be linked together to form um, different proteins by dehydration reactions. So this is just a look how a dehydration reaction forms a new bond, meaning if you take out water, you take out this H, H2O, and we form a bond linking a longer polymer together. A hydrolysis reaction breaks a bond, meaning if we add in H2O, we're adding in two atoms and we'll break apart a polymer into a shorter polymer. So there's a short polymer and an unlinked mon monomer. If we um, take the hydrogen out, that's a dehydration reaction. We get a longer polymer. And then if we add hydrogen back in, hydrolysis will break the bond to get two shorter polymers. Here's a great animation on that. Carbohydrates then range from small sugar molecules to large polysaccharides. Sugar monomers are called monosaccharides and they generally, ha generally have a formula that is a multiple of CH2O and contains hydroxyl groups and a carbonyl group. Um, and we will write the formula for a monosaccharide that has three carbons later. Bees with honey, um, is in honey is a mixture of two monosaccharides. So honey is a type of um, polysaccharide or a sugar. Here's our, the structures of glucose and fructose. Um, glucose is a really important molecule in the body. And we'll talk about that later. Glucose is what will be um, necessary to enter cellular respiration to create ATP for all of your cells to use. Here are three representations of the ring form of glucose. So they all mean the same thing, uh, but they show different um, atoms highlighted. So the structural formula gives all of the atoms in glucose. Here's an abbreviated formula, and then a simple, simplified formula um, shows just the uh, hexagonal ring. Two monosaccharides can bond to form a disaccharide in a dehydration reaction. So for example, lactose, as you read in the chapter introduction, is the disaccharide sugar in milk. It's formed from glucose and galactose. And the formula for both of these monosaccharides is C6H12O6. So what would be the formula for lactose? And we would just um, double everything, c 12 H22, O11 about, because we're, what we're doing is we're just taking glucose and galactose and we're adding them together. So we'll take the um, molecular form formula for glucose and galactose, and then we'll add those atoms together to get the formula for lactose. So here's glucose and glucose joined together, disaccharides formed by the dehydration reaction to form another disaccharide called maltose. Great animation on disaccharides. Are we eating too much sugar? The FDA recommends that only 10% of daily calories come from added sugar, but research and research supports the correlation between high sugar intake and adverse health effects. Sugars often are described as empty calories. And what do you think that means from a nutrition standpoint? Um, added sugars provide energy, but they don't provide any other nutrients like protein, fats, vitamins, or minerals. So that's why they're called empty calories. 
Here's a look at the amount of sugar an average U.S. adult eats in a year compared to the recommendations from the World Health Organization and the FDA. Um, so the average American eats about 130 pounds of sugar in a year. And then the WHO and the FDA recommend much less than that. So watch your sugar intake. Starch and glycogen are storage polysaccharides, means they store sugar as energy to be used later. Cellulose is structural found in plant cell walls. Uh, chitin is a component of insect and crustacean and fungal cell walls. And we can compare and contrast starch and cellulose to plant polysaccharides. So here's a look at the polysaccharides of plants and animals, um, looking at starch, glycogen, and then cellulose, which is found in the plant cell wall. The starch granules in a potato tuber cell, and you can see the starch here in the glucose monomer. Here are glycogen granules found in muscle tissue, and you can see how glycogen stores those monomers together. So there's slight differences um, between how they're storing glucose. Here are the cellulose microfibrils in a plant cell wall and cellulose molecules. You can see how they make strands of um, cellulose bonded together with hydrogen bonds that are holding the strands together. And here's just a look at polysaccharides of plants and animals looking at the potato, the plant, and then your muscles. Lipids then are diverse hydrophobic or water-fearing compounds composed largely of carbon and hydrogen. They're called hydrophobic because fats are unable to dissolve in water. And you know that because you can't mix oil and water together. The oil will always float to the top. Fats, also known as triglycerides, consist of glycerol linked to three fatty acids. Some fatty acids contain one or more double bonds forming an unsaturated fatty acid. Unsaturated fatty acids are typical of plant oils, and fats with the maximum number of hydrogens are called saturated fatty acids, and saturated fatty acids are found in animal fats. Hydrogenated vegetable oils are unsaturated fats that have been converted to saturated fats by adding hydrogen, and this hydrogenation creates trans fats, which are associated with health risks. Um, explain why fats are hydrophobic, and that's because just their molecular structure doesn't allow them to dissolve in water. So here's a look at a dehydration reaction that will link a fatty acid to glycerol. And here's a fat molecule, a triglyceride, consisting of three fatty acids linked to glycerol. Here are types of fats. Uh, saturated fats are found in red meat, butter, unsaturated fats, sometimes known as the healthier fats, olive oil and fish oil. Another animation on fats. Um, by the 1990s, partially hydrogenated oils were common in countless foods, but recent research has shown that trans fats pose an even greater health risk than saturated fats. And the scientific studies establishing the risks of trans fats were of two types. They did an experimental controlled feeding trial. Diets contained different proportions of saturated, unsaturated, and partially hydrogenated fats. And many other scientific studies on dietary health effects are observational. What's the difference between a retrospective and a prospective um, study? A retrospective study looks backward to assess risk fractures risk factors or benefits, and a prospective study follows a group forward monitoring certain health factors and recording health outcomes. So here's the relative risk of heart disease associated with increased intake of specific types of fat. If you eat trans fat, you have a 100% increase in risk for heart disease. Saturated fat is up there, a little over baseline, Monosaturated and polyunsaturated are the best types of fats to be eaten, but please stay eat, to be eaten, but please stay away from trans fat and saturated fat. Phospholipids and steroids are important lipids with a variety of functions. Phospholipids are important, they make up your cell membranes. Steroids include cholesterol and some hormones. Uh, cholesterol is a common component in animal cell membranes, and it's also the precursor for making other steroids, including your sex hormones. 
Um, and you, we can compare the structure of a phospholipid with that of a fat. Here's the chemical structure of a phospholipid molecule. And it has a phosphate group with the lipid molecule below it. So this phospholipid is what will make up um, the phospholipid bilayer in your cell membrane. And you can see here this, this section of the phospholipid membrane. Um, if there's a double bilayer of those phospholipids. The hydrophilic heads will always face the water, whether that's in the interior or exterior environment of the cell, and the hydrophobic tails face each other. Here's uh, the structural um, picture of cholesterol, which is a steroid. Anabolic steroids are synthetic variants of the male hormone testosterone that are often abused by some athletes with serious consequences. Um, another checkpoint question we have, explain why fats and steroids, which are structurally very different, are both classified as lipids. Um, and that's because they store energy and they're also unable to be dissolved in water. Here's a bodybuilder hopefully, but perhaps using some sort of um, synthetic steroid. Proteins are involved in nearly every dynamic function in your body. They're extremely diverse. They can be enzymes. They can be transport proteins embedded in the cell membrane. They can be antibodies, signal proteins, like many hormones are, receptor proteins, contractile proteins found in your muscles, structural proteins like collagen and storage proteins. Proteins are composed of just differing arrangements of a common set of 20 amino acid monomers. The functions of different types of proteins depend on their individual shapes. And in the process of denaturation, a protein will unravel. It will lose its specific shape and lose its function. Why does a denatured protein no longer function normally? And that's because the shape is direct of the protein is directly related to its function. So denaturation usually um, is caused from an increase in temperature or too much acidity surrounding it. And if that causes the protein to lose its shape, it won't work anymore. Shapes of the proteins are incredibly important because they have specific grooves where the target molecule binds. So without the specific protein shape, um, the target molecule will be unable to bind to it. Here's a space filling model of the protein lysozyme showing all the different, all these balls are just different um, atoms that are represented. Here's the fibrous silk protein of a spider's web, which is kind of cool to see. So the spider web is made of protein. Protein diversity is based on different sequences of amino acids, which contain an amino group, a carboxyl group, an H atom, hydrogen atom, and an R group, which is all attached to a central carbon, and the R group is what distinguishes the 20 different amino acids from each other. Amino acid monomer, monomers are linked together in a dehydration reaction, creating a peptide bond. Additional amino acids can be added, forming a chain called a polypeptide. And by what process do you digest the proteins you eat into their individual amino acids? And this is by hydrolysis. When you add a molecule of water back in, you break each peptide bond. Here's a look at the general structure of an amino acid. And again, you have 20 amino acids and they just differ uh, by what makes up their R group. Here's examples of amino acids with hydrophobic and hydrophilic R groups. So they can be water loving R groups, um, amino acids or water fearing. Here's the peptide bond formation step one. Peptide bond formation when it's a dehydration reaction and we take out water. Um, we form the peptide bond to create a dipeptide. Okay, so now we, if we can visualize the, the concept of a protein's functional shape, it results from four levels of structures. The primary structure, which is just the sequence of amino acids. The secondary structure is the coiling or folding of the chain. The tertiary structure is the overall 3D shape and proteins made of more than one polypeptide have a quaternary structure. Um, and we have a question here, if a genetic mutation changes the primary structure of a protein, how might this destroy the protein's function? Well, if we change the primary structure of the protein, which is just the line of amino acids, that will eventually affect the secondary and tertiary structures as well. So obviously that could change the protein's function. 
Here we have um, kind of step one, the primary structure, just showing um, the row of amino acids in a line of the protein. Here's the two types of secondary structures then can be alpha helixes or beta sheets. The tertiary structure is the overall shape and interaction and the quaternary structure is when we have polypeptides associated with each other into a functional protein. Alrighty here. I think this will take you through each one on its own. Here's a protein structure introduction animation and a primary protein structure, secondary protein structure, tertiary and quaternary. So again, these are great animations to watch. We're gonna end this chapter talking a little bit about nucleic acids, um, which are information, ri information rich polymers. The monomers that make up nucleic acids are nucleotides and nucleotides are composed of a sugar, a phosphate group and a nitrogenous base. DNA is a double helix of all your genetic information, and RNA is a single polynucleotide chain. DNA and RNA both serve as blueprints for proteins and thus control the life of the cell, and DNA is the molecule of inheritance. Here's the structure of a nucleotide, um, which will make up the DNA. It contains a phosphate group, the sugar deoxyribose if it's DNA, and just ribose sugar if it's RNA in the nitrogenous base, which can be adenine, guanine, thymine, or cytosine if it's DNA, and adenine, uracil, guanine, or cytosine if it's RNA. So here's a look at a polynucleotide, the sugar phosphate back backbone, and how the nucleotide will stick out. This is um, the nitrogenous base. The DNA is a double helix where the base pairs are always complementary to each other. For example, an adenine base will always pair with a thymine base and a cytosine base will always pair with a guanine base. And they're hold together, held together by hydrogen bonds, which are very weak bonds, meaning they can easily unravel when your DNA needs to replicate itself before cell division or in the process of um, making RNA turning into, into protein. So your DNA, the flow of genetic information is the building of a protein. So you, here we have a gene on DNA. Um, through a process called transcription, that gene is transcribed into RNA. So the information is just passed on um, down to an RNA molecule, which will carry on that genetic information to create a protein. And the process of going from RNA to protein is called translation. What roles do complementary base pairing play in the functioning of DNA? The complementary base pairs uh, will base together so that uh, DNA, when transcribed to RNA and transcribed to protein, can align the appropriate amino acids together. Different mutations in DNA have led to lactose tolerance in several human groups whose ancestors raised dairy cattle, and researchers identified three mutations new mutations in 43 ethnic groups in East Africa that keep the lactase gene permanently turned on. And you can explain how lactose tolerance involves three of the four major classes of bi bi biological macromolecules. Here's a look at lactose tolerance in two different cultures, two different mutations, but the same adaptations, working probably with cows. You should now be able to, after looking at this chapter, do these slides. And then I think the chapter, like usual, ends with just some figures um, that you can kind of review on your own. And that takes us through the end of chapter three. Thanks for listening. And they even give you um, kind of some places to fill in the chart if you want to fill in these charts on your own, which is a great study tool. Hope you guys are all doing well. And thanks for listening.